Antarctica has got things there that are not brought there as well by uh, humans um, outside of the Archie Gabriel thing is that, that other beings want access to. But what's really bizarre is the fact that that the Pope and the head of the Orthodox Church in Russia would get together and take care of that thing. In all of these cases, there was some type of plasma burst. There was some, it was, it was more subtle than that. It was more like a very agitated, crazy energy that came out of it. There were two things that came out. One was what is Operation Argus? Because Operation Argus, where a few nukes went off um, that were basically below South Africa. Like all the viewers saw this, they had their, a bunch of these guys that were probably around three to four feet tall. They had these sort of big round faces with larger eyes. They weren't grays. What are they going to do? Come out and say that they found the Ark of Gabriel and it can transfer matter into plasma and then they can use the plasma for energy? That's probably, you know, not going to happen. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Metaphysical Podcast. Well, we've been doing a marathon of episodes diving deep into the secrets of Antarctica. So after our last episodes, looking at the clandestine military operations under Admiral Byrd, talking about the evidence of ancient civilizations on Antarctica and discussing mysterious Nazi history on the continent, we wanted to look into the unusual events that have happened there. Have you ever heard that the rumor that the Ark of Gabriel is hidden on Antarctica. How about nuclear testing on Antarctica as far back as the 1950s? We also came across the strange death of Admiral Byrd's son that some think was fishy, but we'll let you be the judge. If you like mysteries and unsolved histories with missing answers, this episode is definitely going to blow your mind because some of the remote viewing data from John's team may reveal truths never exposed before. So join John Vivanco and me, investigative researcher Rob Counts, for a show that's out of this world. If you're listening to us on a uh, well video platform or wherever, just please leave us a five star review. It really it really spreads the show. And also, you know, you got to make sure you like and subscribe. Otherwise, you're going to miss these crazy episodes. So, yeah, those things really help the channel, especially when dealing with how to get through to people uh, these crazy algorithms that they have out there. So. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. I mean, heck, I was I was banned from Instagram based off their algorithms. What? So, hey. why? What happened there? Is it like I, information? Well, they say or... I'm a bot. They they said I was a bot and they just oh. completely removed my account. Wait, wait. So <laughs> I don't know why. Are you using a a VPN? I was using a VPN. Uh, yeah. They, so they don't like that. They really oh, want to oh, know yeah. where you are. Yeah. Yeah, so John is a little bit more adept with uh, cybersecurity than most people. That's what you're hearing right there, everybody at home. Not that it matters. Uh, yeah, I mean, not that it matters, really. I mean, they can see you with satellites from any place on Earth yeah. at any moment and find your heartbeat with a satellite. So exactly. Yeah, there you have it. DNA signatures, even. <laughs> right. Well, you know, uh, I'm pretty excited about this episode because as much as this episode is related to Antarctica, it actually has something to do with ancient relics. And I really didn't expect this series to go that way. But in fact, here we no. are. Well, I mean, you know, you'd think that <clears throat> there would be ancient relics in Antarctica, but we hardly have any any whistleblower type people coming out of that place or or information where people have been like hey this they're they're putting arcs here there are arcs in this specific place this base is a warehouse for these things or whatever because right. i mean if some of these arcs are dangerous or they have these powers that you know hitler was looking for it would make sense that there would be a place where these potentially radioactive things are put you know to keep everybody safe i don't know right. Right. Well, I'm sure they are. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm sure that there's so much toxic whatever buried in the ice there to keep it out of harm's way. That's that, true. You know, I'm sure it's probably well, a you know, jumping ground. Every time I think of like relics being put into a warehouse, I always think of that scene in uh, Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark where at the very end, that guy is just carting the Ark through this warehouse that has like infinite amounts of boxes just leading down into that perspective of like infinity. 
I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know. It's funny too. It's funny to me that like when we think of this stuff, we think of Indiana Jones too. It's like, is this like the only cultural reference we have to it? It's kind of like, yeah. okay, so I grew up in Southern California and we would go to Disneyland and Disneyland's got all these, you know, recreations of the Southwest and stuff like that and the Pacific Northwest and things like that. So anytime I go somewhere, I think, wow, man, this place looks just like Disneyland. It's really <laughs> sad. It's really, really sad. That's how they've gotten us culturally, I isn't know. it? <laughs> Where... <laughs> yeah, we reference it like or like, you know, you you see something and you're like, that reminds me of that movie, The Goonies. You right. Know, like, right. You know, why? <laughs> why would that be? It's like, well, there's gold and there's a ship. Right. <laughs> <laughs> ah, one eyed Willie. Yeah. Every time I look at politicians, I'm like, this reminds me of that movie Goonies because I feel like I'm watching sloth. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm just kidding, kind of. The Ark of Gabriel. So most people, when they're talking about arcs, they're definitely going to be mentioning the Ark of the Covenant. I hadn't really heard of the Ark of Gabriel. Um, what you guys are looking at on screen right now is the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant uh, was described very, very clearly in, um, I think it was the Book of Solomon, actually, where it describes this golden uh, box with uh, these sort of like eagle-like or winged figures on top pointing towards one another. The uh, Indiana Jones film actually very accurately showed the Ark of the Covenant in the film. They did their research. Uh, you know, it is funny that, that we think of, when we think of these arcs or these relics, we think of Indiana Jones because largely what Indiana Jones was doing was t retelling the story of the Nazi search for these relics just through Indiana Jones. And the first reference point for Indiana Jones, that first movie, was really a retelling of the story uh, from a book called The Spear of Destiny by Trevor Ravenscroft. So uh, if you guys are interested in the real life story that, well, alleged real life story of uh, The Spear of Destiny, highly recommend you read that. We have a whole series on this on Rise TV that goes through and explains everything, and it is mind-blowing. So highly recommend checking that out. Yeah, but yeah, that's so, a good series. What is the arc of Gabriel here? Because a lot of people probably haven't heard of that. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's, it's not in the Bible. Um, it was supposedly um, given to Muhammad, um, the, the, the beginning point of the Muslim uh, religion. So it was supposedly given to Muhammad, and it is said to be a heavenly weapon that Archangel Gabriel had instructed Muhammad to keep safe and to keep hidden. So that's really the beginning point. Now, when you get to more details on it, there really aren't. There really aren't. Other than the conspiracies under the surface that the Catholic Church had gotten hold of documentation on it. And it sat on it for a long time and then later gave it to uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. But we'll get to that part a little bit later. So the Ark of Gabriel, you know, the whole the whole supposed finding of this thing was probably around 2015. Actually, when it became public, I'm sure, you know, people had known about it before then. But it was supposedly dug up during construction of a mosque, um, I think, near the Hajj. And the Hajj is in Mecca, right? In Mecca, right. Yeah, the Hajj is in Mecca. So apparently what happened when this thing was dug up was that a sandstorm came, a massive storm, wind, rain, and a crane fell and killed or injured probably over 100 people there. Um, killed 100 and I think 200 were injured. Right. There you go. Crane collapse. Now, wow. Some of the people said that there was an explosion, like a like plasma coming out of where they were doing this construction. They dug it up underground, right? Okay, so later on, they went back to construction, right? So there were all these Muslim worshipers gathering at Mecca to, you know, go and circle the Kaaba, um, the big, the big uh, square structure they have in the middle of that. That's the cube, um, the black cube, the cube basically. The cube, they, right. They and, and exactly. On the, on the side of it, it's got this uh, meteorite, meteorite, black stone, right? And they, they worship this. They all touch uh, it. Though. They touch it, right. 
when they were on their way, when they were on their way to this location, because they pilgrimage, the, the whole crowd went to a massive stampede. 2,400 people were killed. Now, what happened from also, again, some accounts is that there was a plasma burst that caused the people to start running, right? Now, this stuff is not in the mainstream media. Um, this is this is like kept out of it. None of this stuff is, is spoken of. And obviously, too, you know, this stuff is like, who knows for sure, like what truly happened here? This just these could have been natural random events. But this gets to what this thing was and and what you know some insiders or information coming in under the surface talks about this thing being the arc of the gabriel that caused these massive events to occur now what happened after that was that the russians patriarch kirill the head of the russian orthodox church he and the pope uh, the catholic pope I don't remember which Pope it was, but those two, after a thousand years of never speaking to each other, had a meeting immediately after this, okay, which was curious. So then we find that the Russian Navy lands in a Saudi Arabia port, which is also unheard of. Just so you know, it was Pope Francis. I just double checked. Pope Francis. There you go. There's right. a pope. So they had a meeting, right? What did they have this meeting about? So it's speculated that the, the Catholics gave Kirill information on this Ark. And the Russian Navy was heading down there in order to pick this Ark up and take it to Antarctica, a safe location. So oddly, you know, this, these ships leave the port and they head towards Antarctica. Not long after, you find that Patriarch Kirill was in Antarctica as well. So he went down there. He followed them down there. If not, you know, went on the ships. I don't know. I don't know what he did, but he shows up down there in order to consecrate a church, a Russian Orthodox church in Antarctica. And this was around the time before, just before both John Kerry and Buzz Aldrin went down there. I remember that. This, this thing is, is this the, oh, this this is the Russian Orthodox Church down there. Yep, that's so he went down there to consecrate that church. Yeah. Okay. So that's you know in a nutshell that's that's the story of the Ark of Gabriel. We don't really know much more beyond that. Now, is the Ark of Gabriel in this church thing in Antarctica? So we were looking at why, with remote viewing, we were looking at why John Kerry went down there, why Buzz Aldrin went down there, yeah. and then later we had to look at why. Kirill went down there. So when we looked at it, we saw that there was this massive ice cavern. And inside of this massive ice cavern was this thing. It was like, it, it looked like a big printing press, except it was extremely high in esoteric technology. It was, you know, probably in the shape of an ark, as big as what you would imagine the Ark of the Covenant to be. And, and, this device was able to transfer matter. So like they were doing weird things, like they were sticking apples in it, for instance, when we were remote viewing this. And these apples would dematerialize. The matter would completely break up. And then that matter would be transferred somewhere else. Now, it wouldn't be transferred in the form of an apple. It would be transferred in the form of some type of matter that someone else could use and Plasma. reconstruct. Right. Probably so, plasma, probably plasma, probably plasma. So so when we were when we were um, viewing this, it was like Buzz Aldrin was there. Like we were mainly focused on Buzz Aldrin. Like, like what was he doing? Because in the data, there was this like connection between Buzz Aldrin and oddly. I mean, this just sounds wacky beings on the moon. And they had there like all the viewers saw this they had there a bunch of these guys that were probably around three to four feet tall they they had these sort of big round faces with larger eyes they weren't grays but they were 
beings that they brought from, they, they seemed like clones. They were, they were absolutely clones of each other. And they were specifically geared to, to help them figure out, specifically brought to help them figure out what type of technology this was. And that's why, you know, they're sticking random things in there. I imagine at some point they stuck one of these little guys in there too to see what would happen to them. But what we saw was that they didn't know what they were doing. It was like they had no idea what this machine was, ultimately what it was doing, but they knew it was doing something absolutely fantastic. Okay, so we've got that data there, right? We've got this weird device. Now, we don't know if they actually found it under the ice or it was brought there. Okay, so when I was, so we get the remote viewing data and remote viewers don't like name things. They don't say, oh, this is the Ark of Gabriel. They don't of do stuff not. like that. Yeah. They only describe things, right? But we knew that it was very, 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 very old. It was something that was like left over from, from a, a civilization that would create civilizations. They were like uh, the makers of civilizations, the makers of things. And like this, one of these root races things? Yeah, one of these root races. And, and these things were like, like this thing was left over from that, not in use. And there were other beings that wanted control of this device. When I've got all the remote viewing data, I even viewed on this myself, and I'm like doing research on it, I start to see this connection online with the Ark of Gabriel in Saudi Arabia. So of course, you know, we have to try to understand if, if that thing came from Saudi Arabia and it's the Ark of Gabriel. So, you know, we look into what happened to these uh, people that were stampeding, what happened to the crane collapse, how did this stuff happen? So when we look at that, and then also what did they find, right? See if that lines up with our data. So I can say that, that it does look like in all of these cases, there was some type of plasma burst. There was some, it was, it was more subtle than that. It was more like a very agitated, crazy energy that came out of it, right? It wasn't something that was so like apparent that everybody would see it. It was a lower level, like energetic burst. And it caused the people to, to freak out. They, it's like they felt burning on their body without really seeing too much, right? So they started to take off and run and many people were killed. Then you have the crane collapse where, again, it was like, it was like something like melted um, aspects of steel. Like if, 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 if there was some um, uh, mix of like steel and some other substance, like when they're building a crane, like it would have melted those parts, but not all of it right? It's caused it to collapse. So, so we see this stuff and we go, okay, this is very interesting because, you know, there's something weirdly esoteric happening there. And then we look at, at what it is that they found and what it is that they found appears to be the same type of thing that they found in Antarctica, or we thought they found in Antarctica. So, so uh -huh. I'm surmising based on the data that they took this thing, you know, and the research, they truly did take this thing down there to create a safer location and, you know, out of eye shot in order to experiment with this thing and figure it out. And they're working with other beings to do it. And so this was something that caused a lot of um, earthquakes under the surface when it came to those in power because somehow they knew about it because the Russian Navy's involved. They're showing up in Saudi Arabia, which is odd. You know, you've got the Catholic Pope meeting with the Russian patriarch. I mean, this is crazy stuff going on. So of course, you know, people in positions of power are going to know about it. So that is the reason why we get John Kerry, Buzz Aldrin and Kirill going down there, going down to that location. So somebody thinks somewhere that Kirill has some kind of religious knowledge to be able to deal with this thing as well, which, you know, didn't really see that, but, you know, I guess, I guess you can try. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's my like slightly unstable position. I think that that thing they found down there, um, is the Ark of Gabriel wow. or that they took it down there actually. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a very strange story and, and something that was absolutely unexpected to me. Absolutely unexpected. I have so many questions. Um, 
So first of all, I wonder what happened to Buzz because he he had to be um, Lindsay pulled this up while you were talking, but he had to be um, taken off of Antarctica from having some type of bizarre sickness. They called it elevation sickness, you know, because Antarctica is so high. And he was even interviewed after he was interviewed, I think, by CNN or something like that. And he was talking basically about how. You know, he was he, his whole goal in going down to Antarctica, and he said this pretty convincingly was that, you know, he wanted to check it off of his bucket list on places that he's like been and gone to and all of this stuff. And just, you know, it, the elevation just caught up with him too quickly. And uh, which happens to a lot of people, you get elevation sickness. And yeah, here he is talking about it. Why don't you turn that up, Lindsay? We get the news that, that you have to be evacuated. What, what, what happened? I got out of breath. Uh huh. You know, that's nothing new, except uh, it's a little more concentrated. It's cold. Mm -hmm. you got a lot of heavy stuff and not much air to breathe right. up there. At an elevation of 9,000 feet, Aldrin begins showing signs of altitude sickness. He's evacuated from the scientific research station and taken to a hospital in New Zealand, where he spends a week recovering from congestion in his lungs. Well, did you think, maybe I shouldn't have come on this trip? When turning back is about as difficult as, as pressing on, you press on because you got an objective. Especially when uh, they tell me that I just set a record. The oldest guy to the South Pole. See, now it was worth it, really. <laughs> <laughs> It makes sense. You know, somebody's trying to check stuff off of their bucket list. They go down there. But, you know, what's really going on behind the scenes? Nothing is as it, is it appears, I don't think. I mean, especially yeah. when it comes to these things, you know, I mean, we didn't look at what caused him to to get sick there. But, you know, I don't know. I whenever I look in his eyes, I just don't really when he's speaking, I'm looking in his eyes. I just don't feel like he's truthful. It's yeah. just. Not, there's a, something not right. There's a lot going on with Buzz. Yeah. I, I, I feel the same way. Let's put it that way. It, who knows what 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 these guys have been up to for how many years. And, um, you know, you got to make it look normal on the surface or else. I mean, what are they going to do? Come out and say that they found the Ark of Gabriel and it can transfer like matter into plasma and then they can use the plasma for energy. That's probably... Right you know, not well, you know, happen. But the, the thing is, is that when we were viewing this, the viewers were describing um, the, the whole situation there is dumb and dumber because, <laughs> because they were like messing with something. They had no idea what it did or what it was. And even brought in other beings like these weird clone things from the moon. I mean, it just sounds absolutely absurd. You know, that's like multiple remote viewers describing the same thing. Right. And, 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 and they brought those guys in to try to figure it out as well. But it just, I don't know, it was just a whole dumb and dumber situation. I think, and I think a lot of this turns into that. As far as like this technology is concerned, and as far as some of the technology that they have found down there, we are an IQ of one, one compared to the beings that created this technology. So many questions like, it, okay, it said in the texts that the Ark of Gabriel was given to Muhammad and it was buried underneath uh, the mosque or the mosque. So is that where they found it? Is is yeah. it so th they were looking for it? It wasn't just construction because why? I, I it, mean, it seems like they were probably looking for it. It seems like it. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, and it just took them this long to find it because you're looking for now. You're looking for an a, a advanced piece of technology so that you can use it for your own technology, right? I mean, that would make sense. Of course, keep it all secret, right? But what's really bizarre is the fact that that the Pope and the head of the Orthodox Church in Russia would get together and take care of that thing. When you have it being found in Mecca, which is a completely different I mean, spiritual belief here. And there's very di strong feelings between these spiritual uh, beliefs about one another, I think. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, I think ultimately what the, the Russian Orthodox Church 
was an offshoot. I don't know. I don't want to like mess up here of the Catholic church at, at one point, or it was like a reiteration, a couple reiterations from the Catholic church, Christianity, right? Yeah. So I, mean, I don't know for sure though. It's a different flavor of the same different flavor. Thing. Yeah. Right. And, and I think, you know, with Russia too, it's like, you know, there were a lot of different areas that wanted to claim autonomy from the Holy Roman Catholic empire, you know, and, and Russia, of course, they're going to do that. Right. Like they're, they're, they've secluded themselves. I mean, everything that went on during, you know, the, between the 1920s and the 1980s, I mean, they have to be secluded. They're not going to bow to the Roman Catholic church. Right. 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 So it was very odd. It's all, it was also very odd for the Russian uh, warships to show up in a Saudi Arabia port, I think in Jeddah, because that was no, huh? that's that's not supposed to happen. N not considering the, the type of stress that the U.S. and the Russians um, were were under with each other as far as U.S. has got Saudi Arabia. And so they're not going to send Russian warships. You know, because Saudi Arabia and U.S. are very close allies. So they're not going to send Russian warships to a port in, in Jeddah. So that was very strange as well. It was literally like the Pope meeting the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church. Same kind of situation. Man, gosh, it's one of those things where I wish I could actually listen to that conversation and hear what they were saying to one another. You know, yeah. Um, but but what's, you know. I'm putting things together now based on, we, we haven't even done episodes on some of the things that I want to say right now, but the, I really think that if this mechanism that was found can transfer energy or create sort of plasma from matter, it would make sense that this thing would go down to Antarctica for all kinds of reasons for research purposes. You know, it's sort of like the Switzerland for science down there. There's so many things going on down in Antarctica that require tremendous amounts of energy, which we'll be getting into in later episodes. And it would make sense that a mechanism like that could be potentially taken down there to see if it can be used to create zero point energy or zero point. I mean, obviously, there's a transfer of energy here, but energy that they can use to to communicate at greater than light speed potentially you know and there were there were other beings that were interested in this thing outside of just the ones that they brought in it seemed to be that it seemed to be that there's this sort of like like weird uh combativeness and shuffling around with other beings antarctica has got things there that are not brought there as well by uh you know uh humans um, outside of the Archigabriel thing is that that other beings want access to. That was also part of the whole Operation High Jump thing, where these these other beings were interested in in keeping Antarctica to themselves because of things that are there um, and and being used. And so this seemed to somehow catch the eye of these other types of beings who are very let's just say like jealous about this type of technology that truly wanted. They weren't the creators of it. They were, there's some other type of being. And you also find that with Antarctica and remote viewing is that when you actually do happen upon something that is very truthfully strange and bizarre and esoteric technology, you find beings that you haven't run into before when you're remote viewing. Um, we don't know what they are, but it's like they, we just get descriptions of them. Like for instance, with the Ark of Gabriel and uh, this thing under the ice in Antarctica, there are these beings that are almost ant-like in appearance. There is an interest in what is there by specific types of beings that we have not run into before. And, and one of those is this strange looking, like humanoid-ish type of almost ant looking being. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, you, you get this, you get this data, you view it yourself, you, you know, you're blind, remote viewers are blind, and then you get the data back and you're like looking at, well, that, that's a humanoid ant. Like what the, what, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. what, do you, what do you make of that? What right? are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do? Can imagine just, 
you having to become really flexible in remote viewing when you're seeing stuff. And it's like, what's weird is like, if one person saw it, you can write it off. But when you've got a, like a bunch of remote viewers all giving you back similar data about stuff and none of them are talking to one another, they're just telling you, they're like, look, dude, I don't know. I'm just yeah. telling you what I saw. Right. And because they don't believe it themselves, really. And then you're like, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, you just put it together and you're like, here's. Well, I mean, that's the whole thing of it is that, OK, so when you look at remote viewers, myself included, we're given just a random eight digit number. Right. And and that number is given to us by the person tasking. And that number out, you don't know what it is. You don't know what it's associated with because the tasker doesn't tell you you're not supposed yeah. to know. And you just go through the procedure blind. And, and you do, you know, a session or two a day of remote viewing sessions. It could last anywhere from an hour or more. And you just, you know, you're done. You give your data, in, you know, and, and, then, and, then, and then it gets analyzed. And so then when you have corroboration between all the viewers on humanoid ant beings, you're going, okay, well, humanoid ant beings. <laughs> right, right. That's a thing. <sighs> I couldn't help thinking this while we were discussing um, everything about the the strange objects and things that could be on the surface underneath, you know, one to two to three mi uh, miles of ice in Antarctica. And if if what we're seeing right now with the poles shifting is true, you know, we're we're seeing scientists starting to talk about how the the North Pole has shifted somewhere over Russia right now. It's moving towards Siberia. Yeah, it's moving towards Siberia. And now let's say this continues and we have three miles of ice melting, making the water in the entire world go up 40 meters, which is 120 feet. We're going to be losing some of our uh, shores across the world, you know, where we have, uh, I mean, Manhattan's gone. Think about it. Gonzo, right? Yeah, most people live on the coasts. So most yeah, people live on the coasts. Coasts are gone. So, but what would happen is, you know, while this is going on, potentially these areas being evacuated, because this isn't going to happen overnight, right? It will happen fast, but it's not going to happen overnight. We're talking about a month or two or three. Um, maybe potentially more, I don't know, but we would, we would be seeing on Antarctica, a reveal of a very ancient past that would be very difficult to hide unless they shut off, you know, I mean, obviously with the mainstream media saying whatever it is that, that they say, of course, nothing is that hard to, to hide, but it, it would reveal to us many, many things that we're not even aware of down there, potentially. Potentially. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing with Antarctica has been locked in ice for so long that there is stuff under there that is, uh, it's got to be incredibly ancient and very unique to that area, to that continent. And one of the hard things with remote viewing is that when we, when we want to look at something, we can't look necessarily at people's ideas about things because we usually come off of knowns. We, we, need, we need to have something more solid that we can bite in order to task on it, like a photograph, a person's story. But if people are making assumptions about things on what's down there, we can't just do like an open search under the ice. I mean, you can, mm. but you, you're not going to really... Get, you're not going to get a lot out of it, right? So, so we, and that's the hard part with Antarctica because because we have to take these things like a whistleblower, what a whistleblower says, uh, or or why somebody went down there, like in the case of Buzz Aldrin and John Kerry, so that we have something solid, solid connection point. So, yeah, for that reason, Antarctica is a bit difficult to fully flesh out. You know what's going on there? Why John Kerry? Did you look into this? It's weird. It was the same thing. I mean, he he went down to look at this device, like okay. you know, for for the probably the sake of the State Department, right? Because he was he was the head of the State Department, I think, at that point in time, or just just retired from it. I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, and there is like I think during that time, just after that time, Obama flew to New Zealand, and New Zealand is one of the jump off points to Antarctica. So there was the assumption, but we never looked at that. 
some of these things we just don't want to, you know, get involved with. I mean, there's there are things that can happen. So when you remote view, when you remote view things and you make them public, um, some of these things could have classified aspects to them. And that can be a little bit tricky because, you know, that's not something that we want to do. But one thing that I have noticed is that if you remote view something that's classified and it's more conventional, like a conventional thing, let's just say something around the stealth bomber before it was declassified, you can get, you can get like uh, warned for that kind of stuff. But if you remote view things that are classified, but are completely, utterly woo woo crazy, you won't necessarily get messed with. Yeah. Cause it's like, no one's going <laughs> to believe you. They've set it up right. to, for right. everyone to think you're just crazy and make fun of you. You know, it's easier. It's better for them not to say anything Yeah, because all of a sudden they'll confirm it. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Very interesting stuff. And, and we're going to be looking as this series goes on more into some of these, I guess, bases or technology that's actually down there. So hold on to your hats there. But using um, remote viewing, the remote viewing methodology that John has developed with his team, we had a couple of questions based off of the last episode. And there were two things that came out. One was, what is Operation Argus? Because Operation Argus, where a few nukes went off um, that were basically below South Africa, what actually happened with Operation Argus? And the second question has to do with Admiral Byrd's son, whose body, 68-year-old, um, Admiral Byrd's son, his body was found in a barn, which is very bizarre. And we wanted to find out whether or not there was any leads from there that we could we could look into more, especially since Admiral Byrd's um, diary or his reported diary, you know, which I mean, you know, that's really up to you guys to, to research. It looks like there's a lot of opportunities for hoax there. We've got this thing that comes out and Admiral Byrd's son is the one that it, he was supposedly supposed to give it to. Right. So, I mean, which of these would you like to tackle first, Argus or Admiral Byrd's son, John? Well, OK, so Operation Argus, we'll just jump okay. on that. Sure. Yeah. You know, that one was um, basically they were, they were like low yield, uh, high altitude nuclear tests where they were launching nuclear weapons uh, on rockets and 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 I don't know what part of the atmosphere they were going into ionosphere. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, but their claim on this was that they were trying to understand if um, they can create a uh, artificial radiation belt in the Earth's atmosphere. And the ultimate goal would be to be able to uh, fry Soviet warheads that were coming through the atmosphere as they attacked the United States. So they were, they were testing that theory. I think it was called the um, uh, Christophilos theory. I think it was a scientist who postulated this. So, so we wanted to, you know, what, wait, what's the, what, what's the conspiracy around this? What's the speculation though? The Operation Argus happened in the late summer of 1958. Um, you know, and it was basically <clears throat> the United States Navy task force. Right. And it was like you said, what's, what's claimed is that it was classified at the time that they, that they let off some nuclear bombs in the atmosphere or wh wherever it was in the, in, in the sky. And it wasn't really found until 1961 or 1962, I think it was 61, that this was declassified and people found out what they were doing. What's crazy is that they attempted this in the first place. Like, who knows what kind of radiation this could have given yeah. off to South Africans or whatever. I mean, that is like genuinely crazy. But because of when it happened, a lot of people think that this was somehow in relationship to Admiral Byrd's going down to Antarctica and potentially this fight that broke out between either the Nazis and the, um, the U.S. Navy or the parties that were down there, the U.S. Navy and and some type of other race that was down there that they had to fight right. off. Right. You know, so these nukes somehow were used and they just didn't tell anyone about it because why would you? We looked at, you know, why they did this. You know, what was the 
the underlying reason, the main reason for doing this. And what we have is that we've got um, descriptions of waves of energy that are like electromagnetic waves. And what they were, what was happening was that they were <clears throat> literally looking to see if they can manipulate create a hole in and create new energy fields. Like literally that's the extent of our data. Mm. And so based off of that, ultimately their declassification of it was exactly what they did. Wow. So we didn't get anything of the sort that they were attacking anyone. We didn't get anything of the sort that someone was attacking them and they were responding, nothing at all. Literally, we got a science experiment. That was exactly as what was described when they declassified it. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, and I do understand that this was a, actually pretty unique from the perspective of, of testing nuclear weapons. Normally, you know, they, they, they test them for the weapon system as opposed to this type of thing. So this was actually a quite unique uh, event. That they well, did. and I wonder, you know, now that we're we're kind of looking at this from the direction of they're experimenting with this technology from the perspective of energy generating energy or modifying energy i wonder if this experiment helped them in some of their other black ops projects that oh had, yeah i mean you know, all this data gets crammed into a supercomputer and you know they can apply it to other areas. And yeah, absolutely. They they, right. they got a lot of really valuable information from doing this thing. There you go. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So all right, let's just discuss here Admiral Bird's son for a second. Because why did sixty eight year old Admiral Bird's son, uh, Richard E. Bird Jr., why was his body found in a in a barn, which is so bizarre? Like. You know, here it says basically um, his emaciated body clad in dirt blackened clothes and one scuffed shoe. The police there said yesterday. So it was found in an abandoned warehouse in Baltimore, not necessarily a barn, it looks like. So, yeah, abandoned. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was more and I Baltimore. think he was supposed to be on his way down to Washington, D.C. or something. Weird. Yeah, he was going to some like uh, event for his father. And I think he left, what, three weeks early or something? And then never showed up. And then they found him, what, three days later. Uh, actually, what happened was a custodian of the warehouse saw him, thought he was a derelict because they had, had gotten homeless people, you know, trying to yeah. get into that building before. And so he kicked him out. And then he found him, I think, three days later, dead. Okay, so was there um, any kind of story? Yeah. Well, like... so, yeah, we looked at the circumstances surrounding his death to try to understand all that. And what we have, we have a, um, an old man who has a lot of mental problems. Um, he has dementia. Running around with fractured um, thought patterns, thinking that he is is doing something really important, um, and it's like he's he's trying to do some kind of alchemy. Alchemy, like he's he's collecting berries, he's collecting all sorts of different things based off of these broken and just uh, thought patterns that don't make any sense. And I think eventually what happened is that he he did die the way that they said he died, likely, of malnutrition um, and dehydration caused basically by Alzheimer's disease. So there was it was it was more of a natural process in, in, in the way that he died, as unnatural well, as that is. Just to kind of rule all of this out everything that could possibly be brought up here. This wasn't something like MK Ultra to kind of mind control him that broke his mind originally. We're just talking about legitimate old age that wore him down. Yeah, we didn't see anything like that. We didn't see any MK Ultra. We didn't see any poisoning. We didn't see any anything like that. Now, he may have gotten hit on the head at one point while he's um, running around kind of like a homeless person because, you know, just 
the animosity towards that type of behavior by other people, um, mm -hmm. which could have caused a concussion or in, and, and it caused him to be a little bit more loopy. Um, but we didn't see that there was anything like truly nefarious going on. Now, look, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean there wasn't some kind of weird setup, but it was definitely not on the surface. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I didn't really pick up anything there. Didn't really pick up anything there. It was just too bad. Bad situation. Well, if you guys are disappointed by that data, we've got some rather exciting news for you, which is that there are some very real things that we're going to be talking about in the next episode when we start getting into uh, Antarctica technology and UFO tech that's potentially down there. And also a potential base that was found that we found a lead on that we ended up looking into and finding some really exciting stuff on. So um, hope you guys enjoyed this episode on the Ark of Gabriel and the things that are going on down in Antarctica and John Rem John's remote viewing data. Uh, and yes, yeah, stay tuned for the next episode where we'll be talking about a lot of fun stuff. And, uh, John, thanks so much for being with us. All right. Well, you guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode and thought that it was as out of this world as we did. We'll see you next time.